I, uh, he was asking if I wanted him to switch me. I, did, I haven't actually done any slides. Uh, I'd prefer just to, uh, to talk to you guys. Um, I'm from the U.S., obviously, if you recognize my accent. So, uh, and I understand that everybody here, English isn't necessarily their first language. So I'm going to try and make an effort to not speak as fast as I normally do. If I get excited and start speeding up again, let me know. Um, my name is Ryan Russell. If that sounds vaguely familiar, uh, could be a couple possible reasons. Uh, I used to work at Security Focus. Some of you may have seen some of my analyses or something there. I've done a few books, uh, Hack Proofing series, Stealing the Network series. Um, some of you may know me under my alias, Blue Boar. I used to run the Volndev mailing list uh, a few years back. Yeah. If none of those ring any bells and my name still, still sounds vaguely familiar, it's probably because there's an awful lot of Ryan Russells in the world. Um, it's just an extremely common name. Uh, I've had experiences where I go, you know, the airport counter calls up, Ryan Russell, please come up to the desk. Two of us go up there. Every year at Black Hat and DEF CON, there's another Ryan Russell there, so we end up with each other's badges and hotel rooms and things like that. Um, so, so that's who I am. I want to reiterate, uh, welcome to Recon. It's nice to see a, a nice full room. I know Hugo's been uh, a little bit worried how what the attendance is going to be like, so I'm gratified to see that there's lots of people here. Looks like we've got just about the right size for the, for the space we have. Um, a little bit of background on, from what I know about Recon, and, and maybe Hugo can uh, mention some of it at another time if he gets the mic again. Um, last several years at DEF CON, which is where I know Hugo from, uh, we'd be talking outside, and he's usually standing there outside near the pool area with a great big camera hanging off the front of him, if you're used to seeing him uh, like that. And uh, he would ask me uh, every once in a while, um, if I, if I put on a reverse engineering conference or some sort of conference up in Montreal, do you think people would come? And uh, I said, yeah, I think so. What kind of conference would you want to do? I said, well, it would be a security conference because we're talking at DEF CON. And he said, yeah, sort of. So, um, you know, I wouldn't think much about it. Next year I'd see him again, we'd chat, and he'd say, so if I put on a conference up in Montreal, would you come speak? I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And uh, um, I think that was last year. Yeah, that, that was. That was last year, yeah. <laughs> um, and surprisingly, about six, seven months ago, I get an email from him. He says, hey, do you remember me? I'm the guy at, uh, at DEF CON with a French accent who keeps asking you if I have a conference, will you come? <laughs> and uh, I said, sure, I remember you. I've also uh, you know, been familiar with his website where he's got some uh, interesting reverse engineering information and things like that. That's one of my interests, obviously, being here is, is reverse engineering. And uh, he said, well, I'm actually, looks like I'm actually putting it together. So are you still going to come? And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, I, again, I'm pleased to see that the conference is taking place. And here I am. Um, as to why I'm giving the keynote, uh, I don't think there's any particularly special reason. I'm certainly not the best reverse engineer here. Uh, I know a number of people out in the audience who would uh, kick my butt quite readily at it. Um, uh, I don't think it's any, you know, some particularly famous or well known. Yeah, but he's a really good speaker. He knew a lot of domains. So I think it can go more into about doing a great keynotes and putting, showing up for everyone, I mean, right, you're um, you. All right, I appreciate it. I think the real reason that uh, I'm getting to give the keynote, I'm given the privilege of giving the keynote, is because I volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> Hugo had asked, he said, hey, I, I, I'd, I'd set up a talk. If you notice, I've got a talk tomorrow with uh, Nicholas Brulez on analyzing malware. I was smart enough to get uh, Nicholas to cover the unpacking part for me. Um, that was my main talk that I had submitted the technical bit, and Hugo had also asked, just in case of emergency, uh, would you be willing to prepare another talk? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. How about something kind of keynote-ish? I noticed you hadn't uh, had anything on the schedule yet along those lines, and so that's how I volunteered myself, and uh, that's why I get the first speaking slot. Um, let me take a look at my uh, speaking notes here. So I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, 
Um, by the way, uh, if at any point anybody wishes to interrupt me during a talk to ask a question or to ask me to repeat something or to argue with me or tell me I'm stupid, please feel free, shout it out, raise your hand, whatever. I, I'm perfectly happy to have an interactive uh, discussion with everybody. Um, if you are going to tell me I'm stupid, at least be polite. I've got the microphone. Um, I'm going to abuse my position here a little bit and I'm going to take a poll from the audience. Um, how many people in the room uh, consider themselves developers? Okay, that's a good chunk of people, maybe half. How many people here uh, work in the information security field? Okay. Most of you, just about most of the audience there. Um, so I've been wondering what exactly is the link between reverse engineering and information security? Um, I've, I've observed that programmers, uh, hardware engineers, people who are designing things to some degree are natural reverse engineers. Uh, I think a lot of that's fairly obvious. Uh, you have to be able to read in order to write. You have to be able to uh, be able to look at a note someone else's design in order to be able to create your own. And, uh, and I think that's been a common theme throughout uh, most of the industrial history, uh, uh, industrialized nation history. But one of the questions that I have is why do uh, information security people in particular tend to excel at reverse engineering or more accurately, why is it that they've got such a uh, particular interest in reverse engineering? Hang on a second. Pardon me. Again, there's some obvious reasons, I think, as to why the information security people are interested in reverse engineering. Uh, the obvious ones are that it relates directly to the field in a lot of obvious ways. Um, vulnerability research. There is an awful lot of reverse engineering involved with that. Not only finding them in the first place, but also exploiting them if necessary. So uh, there may be a lot of disassembly involved if you're trying to find a vulnerability in a piece of software Certainly, if you're going to be writing any kind of a buffer overflow format string exploit, something along those lines, you have to know assembly on the uh, platform in question, and you pretty much have to pick apart the program to figure out what context you're going to be in. You have to know a lot about, uh, on the Windows platform, for example, how Windows works behind the scenes. Um, reverse engineers probably know quite a bit more about structured, structured exception handling on Windows and how the uh, the, um, the heap is organized on Windows than most programmers would. They've had to go and dig into that area. Um, another obvious reason why people in the information security field have to do a lot of reverse engineering is because of malicious code. Um, that's, that's a big chunk of the information security field is uh, malicious code, viruses, worms, trojans. And by their nature, in order to be able to deal with one of those, analyze um, what it does, you're going to have to be able to reverse engineer it. And so there's some very practical reasons as to why I think <clears throat> people in the information security field uh, have some of the reverse engineering you know, needs that they need to have those talents for their job. But uh, I don't think that's necessarily um, why how, or how they got to that point. Uh, my favorite theory as to why people in the information security field uh, are in reverse engineering is because uh, you guys like to know stuff you're not supposed to know. Uh, and you like to be able to do things you're not supposed to do. That's been an observation of mine, people in the information security field. Um, how many people got into information security for the money? How many people thought, oh, this would be a great job, I'll make a lot of money at it? No, I'm, I'm not saying I did, I'm just saying raise your, raise your, hand. <laughs> raise your hand if uh, if you do. Um, people ask me every once in a while, you know, do you make any money writing, writing books? Uh, absolutely not. There's no way that uh, working on books is uh, anywhere near worth the amount of time that it takes. Uh, right, Varun? Yeah. Uh, do it because you like it. And, uh, and if you have an interesting book idea, talk to me. I've got, uh, I've got a good relationship with my publisher and, and we can get you hooked up there. Um, don't expect to make any money out of it. Um, so I, I didn't see one hand for people as, as to, you know, the money was the reason they got in the information security field. Um, 
You got into it because you were interested. You started out uh, investigating it on your own, I imagine, and later on, after the fact, you made a career out of it. Is that correct? Um, you'll find that most people in the information security field are uh, self-taught. This isn't something that is taught widely in schools. I'm aware that there's a few master's and doctorate programs in information security um, at the college level, and, and that's great. I, you know, I, I wish I had time to go back and take one of those. Maybe I will one of these days. There's an awful lot of, uh, uh, of interesting things that I would like to continue. I've got, you know, I, I got the ba I've got the bachelor's in computer science that I did over 10 years while I was working. Um, but again, I think a lot of the, of the uh, skills that I've picked up uh, for reverse engineering and information security have been largely self-taught. Um, most computer science programs don't cover that sort of thing. Uh, you're fortunate if you get a good professor or if you've got a, a class uh, where you get to do some fun things like writing exploits, doing vulnerability research. Um, in fact, it's one of the schools up here in Canada, I, I believe, that's uh, been infamous, famous uh, for having a virus writing class, for having a uh, exploit writing class, right? They just dumped a bunch of, of exploits onto it. And Daniel J. Bernstein, I believe, as well, down in the US, had a similar thing. So it, it's there, it's starting, but for, for most of us who have been in the, in the field for a few years, that's fairly new. So uh, my belief, my theory, is that uh, anybody who's interested in reverse engineering for the kinds of stuff that we're, we're talking about in the information security field, uh, largely self-taught and largely self-selected. You chose this because you're interested. In fact, probably most of you were interested long before um, you made a career out of it, uh, like myself. I believe good reverse engineers are self-selected. Um, they want to know things that they're not supposed to. They want to know how things work. A good reverse engineer will figure out uh, how to attend a reverse engineering conference. They'll, uh, they'll be able to make arrangements with work or, or whatever is going on with their life and uh, to be able to go and learn more about it. Um, how many people here have, have work paying for their conference? A little bit fewer than I might have expected. So I'm guessing that a lot of you are here, again, because of, uh, of your own interests. How many people here are local? Even, even smaller numbers. So there have been an awful lot of people that have, have traveled and it looks like paid their own money to come and learn some things. Um, I think I've, I've made a point about some, some of uh, what kinds of people enjoy reverse engineering. Uh, and I want to talk about kind of the main point of my talk today is why I think reverse engineering is important. Um, what are the, some of the important reasons for uh, why it's, it's good to have you guys working on this sort of thing. Nearly every time, I, I like to read a lot of biographies about um, historical figures or even recent figures uh, who are in the technology field. I'm not much into biographies. My wife is, she's the one that's reading all of the uh, English royalty uh, but she's got an endless supply of things about the, uh, the kings and the princes and the queens and Henry, all of Henry VIII's wives. And in my case, I'm reading books about uh, Babbage and Wozniak, and uh, I think I've got by now six or seven books on the history of Apple computers. Um, Shockley and the other guy, I can't remember, uh, worked on the transistor, the guys who invented um, ENIAC. Those are the kinds of biographies I enjoy reading. And pretty much without exception, when you're reading one of those biographies and you read about the guys who are creating uh, what are now, you know, for us, uh, very important technologies and products and companies, um, there's always some section of the book where they talk about when they were kids, they like to take stuff apart. They, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, you hear some amazing story like, well, we didn't have computers when I was a kid, I had to build my own. And they talk about how they wire wrapped the Roman calculator together with uh, discrete logic and, and lights and so on for the, uh, for the display. Steve Wozniak in particular, I, uh, I can't remember the particulars, the, the specifics, but um, I've read stories about him where he would take apart uh, game circuits when he was younger. And that was one of the ways that how he learned 
to uh, design circuit boards and of course came up with the Apple One and later products. Charles Babbage, I mentioned him earlier, uh, also the same kind of guy. Obviously a very early pioneer, he's the guy who invented the, uh, the difference engine. This is the early uh, 18th century mechanical computer. Uh, he never got built, uh, he never built one of his own in his lifetime, but uh, just recently was, there was one built by the British Museum. And um, so he didn't have other people's computers to pick apart, and he spent his time picking apart cryptography. There's some good stories about um, him uh, impressing the ladies with being able to uh, decrypt their love letters that they put into the classifieds in the paper at the time. So um, I, I, I've observed, I'm of the opinion that um, reverse engineering is important because there's an awful lot of people who use that as a mechanism for later creating, uh, and in, some, in, in a lot of cases creating very, very important technologies that uh, 30 years later we're extremely dependent on and, and benefit quite a bit from. Uh, to give an example of that, um, if you if you remember back that far, if, uh, if, you're, if you're as old as I am, um, in 1981, IBM came out with the original IBM PC, the 5150. The you know it was a uh, you know 64K floppy drive only, uh, 4.77 megahertz, 8088 box that cost I don't know eight grand or something like that. And uh, of course, this is IBM's foray into the personal computer market. Uh, I understand that it was uh, even just getting out to market was a skunk works within IBM. This is the IBM that thought you know. They originally were a market for three or four computers uh, in the entire world um, back when they were building the large ones. So it's a lot longer back than that. And um, along comes Compaq, Compaq Computers out of Houston, Texas. And they reverse engineered um, the circuits as well as, and more importantly, the BIOS for the IBM PC. Uh, supposedly they did a clean room uh, reverse engineering of the BIOS, which means they had one team pick it apart, write a specification, this interrupt uh, at this address performs this function, these output registers control this piece of hardware, et cetera, et cetera, and then they had another team implement a compatible BIOS on top of that. Uh, that coupled with, of course, the fact that Microsoft had shrewdly kept the, uh, the rights to MS-DOS, um, they asked IBM, hey, can we uh, have the rights to MS-DOS sell it to other people in case it ever becomes popular. IBM says, yeah, sure. Um, those two things coupled together, I, uh, Compaq was able to produce an IBM clone. Uh, if I remember correctly, the first one was actually the huge suitcase-sized uh, Compaq Portable 1 with built-in CRT screen. Um, and that was important for a couple reasons. First of all, Compaq obviously undercut on price. Now IBM had some competition. Um, more importantly, they set a precedent for, uh, and I think they ended up having to do some, some bit of legal battle over it. Um, the fact that yes, you can you know, reverse engineer this. Yes, the, you can go ahead and clone the BIOS as long as you do it in a legal manner. Uh, yes, you can sell compatible boxes. And obviously what's fallen out of that is that uh, we've had uh, really a great market for commodity PC hardware. You may not be a huge fan of Microsoft or the Intel architecture or the IBM PC architecture. Um, there are a bunch of limitations to the fact that we're now, uh, we still have pieces on your computer that hark back to almost 25 years ago, a, a design that ran the CPU at 4.77 megahertz and the bus at eight megahertz. There's still some limitations that follow us if you've ever had to deal with uh, Interruptel, you know what I'm talking about. But um, you can't argue that you've benefited from being able to go to any computer shop in the world and buy the parts you need, get a compatible power supply. Um, I think had that not happened, we'd have a very different uh, picture of what it's like to go out and you know try and build yourself a computer. Um, even even the proprietary computer vendors, Sun, Apple, uh, they've been forced to. Uh, compete to some degree with the IBM PC makers, there's always a, an option for a choice. So uh, Apple and Sun at least have to keep their price at a maximum, maybe only twice as much as a commodity IBM PC. So that's kept their prices down as well. Uh, 
Um, so one of the benefits there for the reverse engineering is that we've had a decades now of a uh, very competitive commodity um, computer market where we've been able to go out and for the uh, for the same you know well I don't know it, it actually it's fairly difficult for you to spend eight thousand dollars on a computer nowadays you can go and get one of the custom paint job extreme gaming machines with liquid cooling coming out the side and spend that much but uh, if you buy even a high-end modest machine you're only looking at about two grand and um, uh, and that's actually been a, a real nice, real nice benefit. So, and this is for a machine that's almost literally a thousand times faster than the original one. Holds, holds over, you know, probably 10,000 times as much on the hard drive. CPU is about a thousand times faster. Um, obviously, some of that's related to Moore's law, but I also believe a huge portion of that is because of competition. The fact that there's a, a free and open market for for the commodity parts, um, and they all work together which is, I think, pretty amazing. Um, and that's been another direct benefit of the fact that uh, there's been this reverse engineering step that there were now two compatible but different BIOSes. Now, if you wanted to write a piece of software for DOS, um, you had two platforms to make sure you worked on, and then later three and four and however many there were out there to the point where um, it was now impossible for someone to have a proprietary flavor of the PC and expect it to be bought. And of course, if you're a software vendor, it was uh, suicide for you to be able, to, for you to take a piece of software and write it to only work on one particular manufacturer's computer. You would just lose in the marketplace. Speaking of interoperability, um, uh, I just got finished taking Nicholas Ruiz's uh, class on reverse engineering over the last uh, uh, few days. Uh, and it was great. I actually recommend it quite a bit. Uh, there's another session coming up at the end, which is already full, but if you're not signed up for one of those or didn't just attend one, and you have an opportunity in the future, keep an eye out for his class and uh, consider uh, consider taking that. I th found it very worthwhile. And I think I talked with most of the students and, and most of them agreed with me as well. Um, one of the students that it was in the class, we went out to dinner, you know, one, one night, one or two nights, and I, uh, while we're walking around, we're asking each other, so why are you interested in reverse engineering? What are you taking the class for? What is it in your job or, or personal life that is uh, leading you to want to be able to learn more about this stuff? And one of the guys I talked to uh, tells me that he's working on, and I, and I believe he's in the room, I apologize for putting him on the spot, I'm not going to name him. Um, he's working on medical equipment. Turns out there's a, a recent standard for uh, electronic medical equipment interoperability, meaning that the equipment's supposed to be able to exchange information. And there is a set of standards that was designed by committee, uh, or as he put it, there was a set of standards that's designed by a committee of committees. Uh, I think he described uh, 10 documents, PDFs of about 200 pages each, describing all the various layers and formats and things like that. And why he's interested in reverse engineering is because he's working with, I think it was a nonprofit, um, who is actually doing the real work, getting the equipment to talk to each other because of the fact that obviously they've all implemented the standards completely differently. Um, things like, he was telling me about a, uh, a picture format. There's a, a, you know, an x-ray machine or something like that, that um, you know, one piece of equipment's interpreting it as row column, the other one's interpreting it as column row. There's things like byte order. There's things like, you know, all the, all the problems um, that you get when you first have a, a standard in place. And the reason he was interested in reverse, reverse engineering is because um, he's actually going to get this equipment talking together. He's gonna build a server, or they're building a server, or may have built one by now, where the equipment will talk to the server, it's going to you know, know what that piece of equipment is and how it's abused the standard, fix it, and actually communicate with the other piece of equipment acting as a middleman. Um, I think that's a fairly important uh, reason to have you know, the right to reverse engineer. Uh, if I, next time I'm in the hospital, I want someone who was a good reverse engineer to have done the work on getting the medical equipment talking to each other. Um, I've got a little bit of time still. By the way, the, the next speaker at 11, uh, 
Jack Witsit, if, uh, if I'm babbling on and I haven't noticed that it's getting close to 11, please just come up and start setting up your laptop. I'll get the hint. Um, I've given two examples of why I think reverse engineering is important. Um, number one is a learning tool. I talked about uh, all of us as well as some of the more famous people who have actually used reverse engineering as a way to learn their trade, as well as uh, I think it's critical for maintaining interoperability. Um, however, I think this conference is a little bit more specific than that, than uh, you know, reverse engineering on a, you know, a company is gonna go tackle reverse engineering and BIOS and create a product. I think we're, we're looking at something a little bit more specific than that. Um, you, may, if, you may, like me, if you're looking at the conference, at the speaker list, you may have noticed a theme to a lot of the talks. And uh, I think this plays into my claim that there's a lot of overlap between the sets of people in the information security field and the reverse engineers. Um, let me illustrate. I picked out a bunch of words from some of the uh, some of the talk titles: uh, analysis, protection, injection, detection, stalking, shellcode, cutlass, attack, malware, hacking, reversing, honey clients, dark side, anonymous, randomness, hardening, testing, and programming. Um, does that speak to infosec to anybody? Anybody else in the room? I think that. Uh, what we have here for this conference is, is a very information security focused uh, flavor of reverse engineering, um, which is great because obviously that's exactly what I'm interested in, so I'm perfectly happy and, and I assume that uh, you guys are as well. Uh, judging on how many people, how many hands I saw for people working in the information security field. This says to me that uh, this conference is about reverse engineering uh, with a particular purpose or set of purposes. Um, if you look back at the list of talks that were given, one of the uh, underlying messages that I see is that um, you can't keep this out. Uh, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter what it is. If, if you've got something electronic or computer related, we're gonna be able to figure out how it works. And I think this is actually fairly important. Um, believe it or not, in, in kind of a roundabout way, I think that this is a uh, important component of uh, uh, we've got a little bit of civil rights activism going on. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, I think it's important for people like the attendees here at this conference to send a message to manufacturers, people setting standards, um, big copyright holders, that uh, no, you're really not gonna be able to lock in someone to your proprietary service and sell loss leader hardware. The reason you're not going to be able to get away with that is because, well, frankly, someone's going to figure out how to uh, solder a few wires or chip onto your box and run Linux on it. And uh, they're not actually going to need your proprietary service for that. Um, no, your DRM media files really aren't safe. Uh, there's always going to be someone uh, who's able to reverse it and actually be able to play it on on other devices or play it in a way that they want to and not the way that you intended them to. Uh, no, your copy protection system isn't going to prevent anything, uh, just like it hasn't since the late 1970s. Um, I, I, believe it or not, I've been uh, kind of uh, looking at copy protection systems schemes since 1981 on the Apple II. They've been trying this for, for a long time. Um, strangely enough, um, fortunately enough, that's been mostly given up in certain fields. There was actually a fair period of time um, where the copy protection was largely abandoned on the computing platforms to, to a large degree. The games seem to have kind of kept it up throughout the years. And that's still the case oftentimes with um, some products, but they've uh, found a much more uh, manageable level. So everybody seems to be willing to more or less live with having the CD-ROM in the drive when they play a game, and the uh, manufacturers don't try too much harder than that. But um, I, feel, I still think it's important for the message to be sent that uh, pretty much any, anything you're going to try is actually going to be broken. Now, obviously, all the reverse engineers in the world still haven't completely eliminated uh, copy protection attempts, and uh, they probably never will. Um, but I think 
the reverse engineers that exist serve as an important uh, balance against those companies who are tempting. Uh, imagine what would happen with the, you know, the DVDs or the game CDs or things like that if every time they implemented some crazy protection scheme that actually worked and stuck and people gave up and went ahead and just bought it anyway because they were, it was hopeless for them to try and get around it. General consumers uh, understand that and, and hold that as a, as a truth. Because um, ultimately, uh, they also have to be the ones who understand that the, the various uh, DRM schemes and other things that essentially punish consumers are, are, are there for really no particular reason and no effective reason. I think it's important that they understand that this actually doesn't stop anything. You know, obviously the, the copyright holders are concerned about piracy, um, and I think it's reasonable for them to be concerned about it. However, I, I also think it's important that the consumer understand that the reaction that a lot of them have to it uh, isn't appropriate and isn't effective. And, and I think that's a, a really important uh, factor for um, uh, having reverse engineers serve an important social function. And I want to, and I want to, uh, Iterate that I'm not necessarily anti-copyright myself. Obviously, I mentioned I'm an author, um, so I don't necessarily uh, want to not make anything on the books or have them go out completely for free, but it's gotten a little bit silly. Um, uh, and again, I'm, I'm U.S. centric here, so I think the current copyright law is that it's 80 years after I die, the copyright uh, is off, 95 years, I can't remember. or, or or is it 80 years after my publisher dies? I'm not sure which one it is. Um, one of us. When one of us dies, 100 years later, uh, you guys can copy the books. Um, that's actually quite a bit silly. Um, I really only have a use for the copyright on any of the books I've done so far for five years tops. Um, after that, it's out of print, it's off the market. Um, really doesn't affect me personally any that uh, if it were to get copied uh, widely. And in fact, I personally would enjoy it. Now understand that I can't give you permission, I don't own the copyrights, the publisher does. Um, but the publisher I work with is, is a small one, it's Singress Publishing. All, all of my books have been done through Singress. And they understand this as well, actually, and uh, I've been talking with the publisher, and uh, hopefully fairly soon, if you follow the regular security mailing list and things like that, you'll see an announcement from me um, where I've been able to uh, make some headway in that area with some some things I've done, uh, some works I've done in the past that the publisher has no reason to hang on to anymore. So I think hopefully you guys will be able to see an announcement from me before too long in that area. Like nothing's finalized, I can't say for sure, but uh, I think you get the message there. Um, so talking about copyright laws, I'm also fairly sad to say, uh, and I apologize. Uh, that the DMCA appears to be making uh, some appearances up here in Canada. Um, the DMCA has been, for those who, I, I'm sure everybody here is aware of it, that has created some of the big problems for um, people who are looking at copyrighted material in the U.S. This is the first time it's actually been uh, codified in the legal system that some of the fair use rights, reverse engineering in particular, have been curtailed. The DMCA specifically has language in it that says, there is permission to still reverse engineer for purposes of interoperability. However, uh, practically speaking, if you watch all of the uh, DMCA takedown types of abuses that have taken place, um, for practical purposes, that isn't actually an exemption. Uh, there's an awful lot of abuse to be had in the US legal system for someone who's got enough money to uh, persecute, prosecute uh, someone who's, who they think is violating their rights. So I'm really hoping that um, the Canada will be able to skip out on most, if not all, of the DMCA type restrictions, and I'm hoping that uh, the European Union will uh, be able to listen to the people who are actually voting and, and not do software patterns. So, uh, hopefully it has not been too, too depressing, and uh, before I'm done here, I've got a few more minutes, I wanna do hopefully what I think uh, I want to show people some, some demos and stuff that I think is really cool. Um, some of the, the fruits of reverse, reverse engineering, if you will. And this is kind of a silly little fun stuff, but um, 
Let me go ahead and switch over to my webcam here. Give that a second to heat up. Uh, I didn't do slides, but I did bring a webcam I wanted to use to show off some stuff that, um, and hopefully it'll show up. Okay, give the projector here a second to heat up so that you get a nice bright picture. And uh, here's my, uh, my rat's nest of cables. <clears throat> and this is a uh, couple things um, in a project that uh, I, I like to think of as, as Linux down my pants. And what it is, is uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, it's possible to run Linux on an iPod. Recently, it's been possible to run Linux on a Nintendo DS. So, as a, and this has been something that, uh, um, and I, and I want to make it clear that I, I can't take any credit for any of this. I've done none of the hard work on this. What I've done is I've bought the toys and bugged the developers until they, uh, until they gave up and told me how it worked. So, uh, people see the picture, okay, okay, it looks good. So, what we've got here, let me see if I can focus a little bit better, is a device called uh, a PassMe. This is for the Nintendo DS. Um, this is the Metroid cartridge that comes with the Nintendo. This game, in my opinion, really sucks. <laughs> and this is a uh, pass me by a guy who calls himself Nature in 42. There's a little plug for his site right there on the bottom of the screen. People can, people can see the pictures okay? Um, that's a PLD, programmable logic device, on the, the chip on there. And what it does is uh, the guys who have been reverse engineering the Nintendo DS for a while, um, if it's not obvious, uh, Nintendo really doesn't want other people run, running code on their equipment, ideally, from their point of view, because Nintendo takes a licensing fee to create official Nintendo games. Um, here's one of the cartridges. Nintendo actually has, uh, I don't think you can see it there very well, but in theory they've got a patent pending on something in this cartridge, which I suspect, should Nintendo wish to, they could use that as a, uh, as a hammer against people trying to produce compatible cartridges. Um, not shown here, but if you look at uh, the Nintendo when you boot it up, there's something in there about an RSA license. And it appears that the uh, Nintendo DS actually does a uh, signed challenge response type of system. Um, when talking to the cartridges, as well as uh, there's a signature on the, on the actual game image. So you're dealing with sign code type of thing. This is similar to what the Xbox does. Um, so there's been a couple of very clever guys. I believe it was um, Dark Vader, uh, as he's called, um, is the guy who uh, did some of the original uh, design uh, he wrote, he uh, broke out the FPGA and got in between the cartridge and the Nintendo. And his, of course, was a great big rat's nest of, of wires going everywhere as he was doing his work. And he was able to actually dump some of the memory going back and forth between the two. And essentially found a flaw. Um, there is at least one spot where memory addresses are going back and forth where you can substitute a different memory address. And the result is that um, on the Nintendo DS, which is, hold on a second, which is compatible with the Game Boy Advanced, um, one of these guys has a compatible cartridge slot in the front. And uh, what you've got here is one of these, you know, flash versions of the cartridge, which are uh, popular with all the uh, with all the kids these days who like to play the games on their uh, Game Boy Advance. Um, basically, he found that he was able to get in between uh, the cartridge, a valid signed cartridge, and the uh, Nintendo DS. And again, I apologize. I'm trying to do this one-handed. I don't think you can see very well, but the pass me just goes into the cartridge slot, 
and now I've got a man in the middle attack uh, in between the Nintendo DS and the uh, cartridge. With the result being, let's see how that's going to look. <laughs> that you can actually run arbitrary code on the uh, Nintendo DS. Um, again, I take no credit for doing any of the hard work here. I actually have a functioning shell. A guy named Pepsi Man uh, has done most of the hard work, and in particular, he was one of the developers that I harassed um, and got this working. It was actually kind of funny. He was looking for volunteers for people to try out his test code. Uh, he doesn't have a Nintendo DS. <laughs> <laughs> or he didn't at the time. So, um, there's actually, multiple, if you're interested in this, I'm, I, again, I'm running out of time here. But briefly, there's multiple ways now to uh, run code on your Nintendo DS. I've got this great big weird thing hanging off the back. Um, it's actually not necessary. One of the things that they found out fairly early on is that you could reflash these guys. And of course, you can load up a flash image that doesn't uh, obey the restrictions. Um, the Nintendo DS's, um, if you're not familiar with the hardware, it's actually got two screens on it. One of them's a touch screen. Um, which is going to be very useful for input. There's actually uh, a Linux for the Game Boy Advanced as well, which is a little bit easier to run code on. Uh, same thing, you're using the little buttons and stuff built in to type, or there's one guy um, outside of the Linux image who's actually got a little tiny keyboard working with these guys. They've got a serial port on them. Um, I think this is going to be a much more interesting platform because it's got a built-in touch screen, which is going to be great for having a little Palm Pilot style uh, keyboard. These guys also have wireless built-in, 802.11b. Um, one of the things that actually got everybody's attention right away, of course, is that if you've got something like the uh, one of the games, Super Mario games, which is actually fairly fun, um, one of the things you can do is, if you've got one person who owns the game, they can fire their Nintendo, they can act as a host, and somebody else with one of these guys without a copy of the game gets to uh, join up as a multiplayer, which means that the game's sent over to wireless. Um, so it wasn't too long ago that somebody found out with a particular wireless chipset that you can get enough programmatic control over, because a lot of the chipsets apparently fix things for you uh, as the packets are going out, as the frames are going out. Um, if you get a chipset you get enough control over, um, it's now quite possible to load up code over the wireless as well, which is actually easier. Um, I expect fairly soon to see a uh, semi-viral version of the uh, reflash BIOS. Uh, we'll see, so you can you know help all your friends out. Um, again, I'm running a little bit out of time here. Let me see if my uh, iPod is uh, going to work. Uh, DSLinux.org if you're interested in the Nintendo DS.